10 second security tip. Go. We all know that your workforce is your greatest opportunity when it comes to training, education, and awareness. What I'd like folks to try and do more of is more partnering with those internal teams that can help you look so good. For example, your learning and development teams and your marketing and communication. They have always been able to polish what I've said to make it so much stronger and more salient. And I hope more folks do that. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Welcome to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. My name is David Spark. I am the producer of the CISO series. And joining me is Mike Johnson, as always. We're available at CISOseries.com. Our sponsor for this episode is Praetorian. More about them later in the show. Mike, I had a first for myself. I've heard bad pitches in the past, but I think I heard the worst pitch I've ever heard. Uh And I actually let the person know that it was the worst pitch I ever heard. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. It's kind of eating me up that I did say that, but I think he really needed to hear it. I read a book or something a while back that was making a point that if you're someone who's sitting there with like food in your tooth, like you've got a little piece of spinach hanging in your tooth. It's kind of uncomfortable to be the other person to say, hey, you know, you've got something in, in your tooth, but put yourself in their shoes. If if you actually had a piece of spinach in your tooth, wouldn't you want to know? And I kind of view this as a similar situation that if it's a really bad pitch, I think the person would really rather hear it from you in kind of a safe environment rather than continuing to go on with the same pitch over and over again. So absolutely right thing to do. Right. And it was safe. It was just one-on-one. That's the other thing. I wasn't in a group. Yes. Yeah. So safe environment. I'm sure it was hard for them to hear it, but it was better for them to hear it from you than to hear it from a potential prospect or frankly, from a group of prospects. That's a really good point. And and I hope he took it that way. And he said, you know, I'm taking this to heart, but he ran into the problem that I run into a lot, which I refer to as the curse of knowledge. Your knowledge about your own product is so deep and you know it so much and you're so passionate about it that you have zero perspective of someone who has none of the knowledge that you have. And he kept like throughout the whole thing would like drop people's names like, oh, well, you know, so-and-so. And And I go, no, I don't know (laughs) so-and-so. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think you're putting it very well, and, you know, that as a curse of knowledge that sometimes you need to sit back and realize that the person that you're talking to isn't in your head. And, and so you're going to have to explain a few things and take some of those cues. And that's it's, it's really great for face to face where you can get some nonverbal cues to let you know that maybe you should adjust as you're going. Well, by the way, he was not on video, but I was on video, so he could definitely see my face. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let us bring our guest on for today's show. It is Mark Eggleston, who is the VP of Chief Information Security and Privacy Officer at Health Partners Plans. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mike. Looking forward to being here. How CISOs are digesting the latest security news. Good cybersecurity hygiene is critical, not just to mitigate breaches, but also the valuation of a company, especially during a merger or acquisition. Itzik Kotler, co-founder and CTO of SafeBreach, notes that back in 2016, the Verizon acquisition price of Yahoo was lowered nearly $350 million after Yahoo disclosed data breaches that had happened up to two years earlier. Kotler said, Quote, the problem is cybersecurity risk from mergers and acquisitions perspective should not be about what has happened, but about what vulnerabilities are being introduced and what could happen as a result. Mike, I will start with you. Have you ever been involved in assessing another company's security posture ahead of a merger or acquisition? Yes. And there's really two phases of this. One, there's the pre-signing, like due diligence before a decision is made for the acquisition. And then the other stage is how is the integration going to work? The former being involved before the the terms are signed, I've very rarely been involved in that. The latter, which is great, we've made the deal, we're going to be purchasing this company, we're going to be merging, acquiring, whatever. How are we going to do the integration? Absolutely involved with that rather frequently. At Salesforce, we actually had a playbook and it was a playbook for the entire security team 
everyone knew what their roles were. And we would also share our expectations with the company that we were acquiring. We had these stages that we would go through. We had maturity requirements. It was an amazing playbook that we built out over several years. And it really gave everyone involved a very clear path. And I like what uh, Itzik here is talking about, the vulnerabilities introduced both at Salesforce and at Lyft. It was, what are the standards that this other entity must meet before we connect? What is it that they have to do before we're going to potentially expose ourselves to vulnerabilities? What are those minimum bar standards? So I, I like the way that he's thinking about it in that it's more forward looking. You should absolutely understand if there were breaches in the past. You should understand if potentially there's someone in the environment today that's not supposed to be there, but you should also be looking forward for what are the additional exposures, vulnerabilities that we're going to introduce by bringing this company on board? Mark, I throw the same question to you. Have you been assessing another company's security posture during a merger acquisition? So when it comes to M&A activity, I have some experience in having that on the acquisition side, being a target, and then certainly looking at several vendors through a vendor risk management program. But I was intrigued by the article. I thought it was very interesting to try and take a more proactive stance on doing an audit. You know, I think we're all used to the checkbox type things, show us your PNP, show us your evidence of complying with said PNP. So the author's thoughts about actually going in to, to try and look at phishing test results, I thought was, was really good. And I think even our industry is going to need to work a little harder on some of these things too and showing the efficacy, right? So we all know there's you know security scorecard vendors out there that will tell you a security score for your outward facing security controls. I'd love to see more rigorous third-party research show that those actually have true predictive nature because I think that'll really help what the author was kind of getting at. A little intimidated by some of the author's findings too when I was talking about the lateral, the east to west movement too, because there you're talking about insider threat. And I think that's probably the Achilles heel of a lot of organizations out there. That's a really, really tough threat to try and defend against. But, you know, as I, as I looked at the article more, I started to kind of think, yeah, this could be something you could actually operationally define and check for, like checking your human resources office and making sure that they have documents or uh, clear evidence of when employees were found to violate security policy and what type of sanctions were provided, because that's a cornerstone of a lot of security programs. I think we're all used to perhaps looking at vendors and getting a vendor to come in and find you know, IOCs or indicators of compromise as well. So I think those are some good findings that the author is saying, and, and I'm hoping that we'll see more of that out in the marketplace. What I was most fascinated by this article was really about the essentially attaching dollar amounts to this. We keep hearing this like, what's the ROI? What's the ROI? And this was something where you could actually see that poor security resulted in lower value and there was dollars attached to it. So how do you communicate to the acquisition team? And I'll go back to you, Mike, about what your findings are and how does what you say get communicated in a way that they can put dollars to it? Or do you, are you like befuddled by at that point? The dollars question is actually the easier one to answer, which generally, I mean, it's, it's a rare thing that you're going to see a purchase price influenced by a security issue. But this author pointed out a few cases that it very much was. I think those are more of the exception rather than the rule. Sure, the Yahoo acquisition, that one was already a weird one in the first place with the splitting up Yahoo into two and there had been a breach. So the Yahoo thing was, that one's like the real oddball. And then there might be some others here and there, but I, I, I really think it's a very rare thing. It has to be kind of a really serious issue. I think looking at it in terms of there's been a security issue, we're going to reduce our cost or reduce the price that we would pay. That seems like a very rare thing. On the flip side, when you look at internal budgeting, internal costing to the acquiring company, these are our costs of acquisition. That's where you can bring money into the equation. You can say, we took a look at their security. They're really immature. It's going to cost us X amount of dollars in order to make them safe, in order to be able to integrate with them. That's where you can start having some dollar amounts. And that's part of the communication back to the leads of the acquisition. Here's our findings. 
here's where we think they need to be from a maturity perspective based on what you want to do with the company. And, and that's kind of another thing. Sometimes an acquisition is what's known as an aqua hire. Don't really care about the technology. There's a bunch of really smart people. We just want them to come work for us. So we're going to buy the company. In that case, the security concerns are much less. We know we're shutting it down. We're not going to have to worry about any integration costs or whether or not, frankly, that there was a security issue there. We're just shutting it down versus this is a big brand with billions of customers. We need to keep it running. The the value is in the users. And if the users think it's insecure, they're going to leave. Therefore, the value of the acquisition goes down. But that's just such a rare thing. Why is everyone talking about this now? An interesting question on Quora asked, do you regret working in cybersecurity? Most people said no, not surprisingly, but I know there's frustration. And we talk about it a lot on this show. One mentioned the boredom of, or clients only paying lip service to implementing digital security. So I'm going to assume both of your answers are also no. You can say otherwise. But have there been times you questioned your getting into cybersecurity? And if not, what are the aspects of cybersecurity you see your counterparts wishing they hadn't gotten involved? And I'll start with you, Mark. This is a great discussion. And like you theorize there, David, I love what I do. I, I truly do. I mean, this is a wonderful profession. I tell folks all the time that if you can get into IT, take it. If you can get into healthcare, take it. If you can get into security, take it. And here I am lucky to have all three of those areas as my career. I do think it requires a certain level of resiliency in the person that's coming into cybersecurity. And, you know, I, I think the other piece that's not really mentioned in this article is some of the mental health issues and some of the stressors and how we as predominantly male population are taking on some of those things. So no doubt that cybersecurity attracts some really smart people. And if you like working with smart people, it's great. It's always changing. It's always in demand, fast pace. I mean, there's just so much to really, really enjoy out of this career. But you do have to take care of yourself. I think the old saying is you cannot pour from an empty pitcher. So you need to ask yourself, what are you doing for work-life balance? I think it was even in a Forbes article earlier this year that they had 91% of the CISOs rate the job as being moderately high. And I think that same article went on to say that one in six were now using alcohol or some other type of medication. And by right. the way, the other, the other five were lying. So, you know, <laughs> it's interesting. And I think as a profession, if we work more and let people know that there's no stigma in going out and getting some extra help or make it more operational, for example, instead of sending somebody out for the latest Linux course or getting certified on the technology platform you know, that you've recently acquired, maybe get them out there and have some leadership courses and making sure they're taking care of themselves first. Doing some low stress items like skunk works where you put down a hundred or you know a couple thousand into a some technology and have your teams just kind of play with that and see what they can come up with. Those are the type of things that I think really help. Last but not least, job rotation. I mean that's a security control. And if people are getting burned out with the type of job skill that they're working on, the type of function that they're performing, give them the opportunity to go beyond that. With my management team, we've used the CISO mind map and some of the other standards from like ISC Square to say, hey, here's the areas that I think that you're going to excel in this position, but what else do you want to take on outside of what I'm thinking this needs to be part of your role? So giving people to try things outside the area of comfort, of course, helps them grow in new ways, but it also helps them kind of de-stress if you can. All awesome advice, Mark. And I would point people to also listen to our episode of Defense in Depth entitled CISO Burnout. We have Gary Hayslip, the CISO of WebRoot on. And that, not surprisingly, is our most popular episode so far. Wow. Mike, I'm again, it's going to assume that you don't regret going in cybersecurity. If you did, you would disappoint a lot of our listeners. <laughs> but I'm going to ask, is there something intrinsic to cybersecurity that you think people do regret? I want to go back to what Mark had said, and I think that's really the key thing is I don't think people understand the amount of stress involved in security. And, I, and so I think that's where a lot of regret comes from. Are you saying that when they go into it, they don't understand the level of stress they're going to be facing? Yes. It is a stressful job. It is a stressful position to be protecting others, to be protecting a company. 
so there, there's an inherent amount of stress involved. And I think some people who come into the industry look at it as, hey, there's all these flashy lights and we can play cops and robbers. But the reality is there is stress. And if you're not paying attention to that when you come in, if you don't know that that's involved, you can find yourself down the road burned out and wondering why you got involved in the first place. That's kind of the key is to recognize that that stress is there and do something about it. Have hobbies, work with the rest of your team on making sure that that everyone is recognizing that they have stress as well and and helping them through it. Acknowledge that it's there and do something about it and that'll really help out in that in some of the the concerns that people have on burnout on even the frustration side of things, if you understand that, frankly, you're not always going to get your way and you need to figure out how you can encourage others, how you can convince others, how you can influence others and recognize that that's a skill in security, that will also help with that frustration. But going in and assuming that it's going to be low stress and that everyone is going to do what you say because you know, you're know you the smartest person in the room both of those are going to set you up for really regretting being in security. Oh, and by the way, I think we've all faced that kind of person, the one who thinks they're the smartest in the room and you should just listen to me. Yep. <laughs> we, we've all we've all met that person. I yes. think we've also all had the people that are, you know, the department of no, that love to come in yes. and block things, which only leads to more stress. So, you know, allowing your team to come up with, you know, how could you enable this wild, crazy idea that the business has? And I think they'll look at you crazy, but it begins people thinking that they don't have to own all the no's. It was put to me several years ago that CISOs do not own security. It's the business that has to sign off on that risk. We certainly manage that, but ultimately the business and the executive level is really responsible for for that remedial risk. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a really good thing to point out. And I think that's it's not just the CISO, it's everyone in the security organization that has to recognize that your job is to point out the risk, to accurately pinpoint it, and then to work with the rest of the business on how to decrease that risk to an acceptable level. Recognizing that, you recognize the need for compromise, but you also recognize that you're not having to own it. I think we're slowly getting better about this. Remember, you know, the state of the art several years back was red team, blue teaming, and now it's more about purple Mm -hmm. team. And I think that has come about because nobody wants to be the blue team and just get beat up. You want to have some of this purple ideology, which, you know, allows the blue and the and the red to work together to come up with actually setting proactive defenses. So I think that's a good way to look at it. Well, make it less adversarial. We all know that the warfare, cybersecurity is asymmetric anyway. We only have to be wrong once to let the breach through. It's time to play What's Worse. All right, Mark, you've heard this show before. You know how the What's Worse game goes. I give you two scenarios. They're both no good. You have to decide which of the one you believe is worse. I always have Mike go first. And this what's worse scenario comes from Brad Green of Observe IT. And he asks, what's worse, trying to secure an end-of-life technology that no longer receives updates but is critical to your core business or securing a bleeding-edge technology where security considerations are not fully understood but the adoption appears to give your company a competitive advantage. Mike, what's worse? Wow, this is a really good question. Yeah, I like this one. Yeah, this is a good one. So I've I've certainly faced both of these challenges. Working at a manufacturing company back in the day, we had some technology that was well, well, well beyond end of life, but critical to the business. And it was certainly at more technology-focused companies Bleeding edge is the name of the game. But you know, in order to just think about which one of these is worse, I really look down the road, what the kind of the future brings in terms of things getting even worse. And so I'd really say in this situation, the old technology that there's no support available, there's no maintenance available, that you can't update it. That seems like the worst one to me. The bleeding edge, at, at least there's hope. Whatever security that may come about, at least it's going to start appearing. Like right. where the other, it's not even going to appear. 
Right. You, you have zero chance for the old technology for security to suddenly appear for that. So that's why I, I lean towards that one being the worst of these two scenarios. All right. Mark, agree or disagree? Wow. That is quite a dilemma you've presented here for us, David. Well, credit Brad Green. <laughs> I'm going to respectfully disagree with Mike, but try and add a couple points Great. here. <laughs> so let's face it, they both suck. You know, when you're talking about the bleeding edge technology, my assumption there is that's probably something from the IT organization, and we are probably more owning that piece there. So I think that could be worse. Whereas if you have the end of life technology, typically you can transfer that risk to a business unit, really. And that's back to our earlier points. It's the business that ultimately owns that kind of residual risk. So I would say that securing end of life criteria can be done through segregation, you know, bastardizing it, for lack of a better term. But ultimately, it's the business side. Who's our sponsor this week? It's Praetorian. Want to see how your defenders and their systems fare against sophisticated attackers in a safe environment? Stress test your team's capabilities against red team exercises led by Praetorian's team of world-class professional operators. During red team exercises, Praetorian simulates real-world attacks, techniques, and procedures used by today's sophisticated threat actors so you can see how you would match up. Comprehensive and clear reporting illustrates successful methodologies for your defenders. They also work with your defenders to provide recommendations to senior leadership for threat detection and response improvements. As trusted security experts, Praetorian helps customers fortify defenses as well as reduce time between intrusion, incident detection, and remediation. From red team operations to blue team defensive enablement, Praetorian provides a full suite of professional services designed to help you defend the enterprise. Sophisticated red team exercises only are part of the portfolio. Learn how Praetorian provides CISOs with valuable leverage across every phase of the enterprise IT security lifecycle by visiting praetorian.com slash CISO. And Praetorian, by the way, is spelled P-R-A-E-T-O-R-I-A-N. And we'll actually have a link for that in the show notes. It's time for Ask a CISO. Eric Rindo just graduated with his MS in cybersecurity. He has a certification, but zero experience. He's looking for his first InfoSec opportunity. Mark, I'll start with you. As a CISO, what's attractive about a candidate like Eric? Well, I always like to tell people that if you're going to get into cyber, there's really three things you want to have, education, certification, and experience. And in fact, you only need to just pick two to really be successful. All three is certainly going to help you knock it out of the park. So let's look at Eric. Eric not only has a bachelor's, Eric has a master's. So he's knocked it out of the park on the education piece. He's also shown a certification level, which is perfect. So he's just got that catch-22 issue with experience. So I think getting somebody like Eric to come in and maybe help you with the GRC, your policies and procedures, auditing, and also with the added advantage of auditing some business units and helping him learn the business, Eric could be well on his way to a great cybersecurity career and leverage in that expertise. All right. That's a great tip. Mike, anything to add to that? What I would add is, I like the way Mark laid it out, is here's three areas, pick two. What I would say is, for many of those, you can substitute passion. If you substitute, I don't have experience, but I have a passion for it, and I can illustrate my passion for security, that's someone who I can bring into an organization. I can train up. I can know that they're really going to be excited to jump into any area of security because they've got that passion for it. There are definitely entry-level roles in security. And you know, you could bring someone in like Eric, give them some of those entry-level projects and see how they go. And it might be one of those where you learn very quickly that Eric is amazing and responsibilities just rapidly increase. Or it might be that, you know, Eric's not interested in this particular area of security. Let's find something else. But someone who has a passion, has shown a willingness to apply themselves, going through and getting a, a master's degree, you've really got to be committed. You've got someone like that, and really they're just looking for a shot. I really like giving people a chance. I have had that at several points in my career that someone has been willing to give me a shot. And so I 
intend to do the same. Someone who can come in and has shown the passion, has shown the knowledge and the willingness to learn, that's a great person to have on the team. Yeah, those are great points, Mike. And I'll second the whole passion piece. It's after the prerequisites, it's one of the first things that we rank as the most highest attribute on our team. And every single one of the security and privacy folks in the home or my home team are are just excel in that. I think another piece that's really important is having that hacking mentality, right? So, you know, there's been a great thing I've seen in cybersecurity over the last year or two where we're always saying that, hey, no more hoodie hackers, right? So hackers have somehow gotten this bad reputation. And cyber criminals are bad. Hacking, not so much. So if you can get somebody who likes to try and reverse engineer things, who likes to try and find separate purposes for what the stated purpose of a device or a software package is for, those are great security professionals because they automatically look at things and see how to break them. So that's another piece we look for. And let me throw out for the Eric's of the world who do get a job, get their first experience, what are ways they can demonstrate that they are a truly passionate and you love their work and they can advance quickly. Like what are the signs like, Oh, we got to move this guy or woman up curiosity, right? So having that curiosity and asking questions initially, and then taking something and working on it off to the side of your given responsibilities means a whole lot. The other thing I'd offer Eric is with his, background, I imagine he's probably taken a lead on some school projects. He's probably proud of some other things that he's done to get his master's. And he should kind of color his LinkedIn profile or his resume with those things that shows just what we're talking about here, showing some escalation in his responsibilities and his achievements. Mike? I would agree with all of those points. I would say that I look for extracurricular activities. When I'm looking at a resume from someone fresh out of school, I look for, you know, what clubs were they a part of? Did they go to any conferences? As Mark was saying, were they leading any projects while they were in school? Highlight all of those. And that really stands out. That says, hey, this person not only is really interested, they also are going above and beyond. They're doing more than just their schoolwork. And that's then attractive. The curiosity is really key. Wanting to know how things work, wanting to deep dive into something and better understand it. That's really one of the things that you look for after a person has started. And you can kind of start to learn that they have this, to what depths, what are their areas that helps a manager or leader better understand how they can help this person improve, how they can help this person better apply themselves to the job, the role, and the career. What do you think of this pitch? Aaron Sangay of Absolute Software gives this pitch, and I would like both of your critiques. Here's the pitch. Absolute is the only endpoint solution embedded in your computers, tablets, and smartphones. IT and security teams rely on Absolute for three critical pillars, asset intelligence, automated endpoint hygiene, and continuous compliance. Absolute is able to do this for you thanks to our patented persistent connection to all your endpoints and the data they contain. So you're always in control of your distributed endpoints. I will start with you, Mike. What do you think of that pitch? I'm confused. I mean, I I look at this and it's like, do I already have absolute in my endpoints? I I don't know what this, I guess, like I said, I'm just, I'm confused. And so I'm, I'm having a hard time with it because I don't know what it does. I don't know how I would fit it into my environment. I'm not familiar with any real technologies that are able to bridge this gap between regular computers and you know the mobile devices. I guess I just, they need a little bit more of what it does, how it does it. Now, let me also qualify that I always, I force people to keep it to 30 seconds. So what would you take out to be able to do that? I mean, this feels like it's well under 30 seconds already. Well, it is 30 seconds, I think, on the nose, actually. Oh, okay. (laughs) Yeah, you can't really add anything to this. Wow. I'm just forcing people to give good 30-second pitches. Take out the pillars. You know, replace that just with what does it do? Why do I want it? And spend a little bit more time on that. If I better understand what it does just and maybe a little bit more of how it does it, I don't know that I need to have the the pillars listed out as the way that they have. All right. Mark, what do you think? 
Yeah, Mike did a great job analyzing this one because like himself, when I first was exposed to this, I kind of had to read it a couple of times to try and understand what exactly it is they're trying to get across here. So, you know, plus one for naming their solution after a premium vodka. After that, <laughs> as I'm looking through this, I'm a little bit prone to not like the words only. So when I see this is the only mm. endpoint solution, I'm kind of like my BS detectors going off a little bit there. And then when I read embedded as well, uh, I'm kind of like uh, embedded might not be a great thing, right? We all remember the the Mirai camera attacks where you had this embedded firmware that couldn't be updated and, you know, was used for a big distributed denial of service attack. So that kind of seems like a liability to me. But like Mike said as well, I think I've already got this stuff. I've got something out there that's hitting these three points. I believe. And so it's not clear to me what they're doing above. The other thing here, and I think this is so important with vendors these days, think about the cloud. Most organizations are moving to the cloud or adopting a cloud first strategy. So endpoints, while it's not, it's it's certainly still important, it's becoming less important. And I think most of us are moving to a zero trust control. So again, the endpoints are not going to be our paramount concern. I want to know how this is helping me with some of the cloud pieces or how it might help me with a containerized approach. So those are the things that are going through my mind. And let me ask you guys, whenever you see the word patented, <laughs> would you ever at one point go, well, we can't, here are two equal solutions. One's patented and one is not. Would you actually care? No, patent doesn't mean anything to me. I'm sure they did a lot of work to get that patent. I'm sure they're really proud of the fact that they have it. It doesn't you know, have anything to do with anything that I would decide on. So it doesn't really mean anything to me. Yeah, I would agree. And I would add that, you know, when you have a patented solution, okay, well, well, someone said you've got something unique here. Go ahead and tell me your special sauce. So when I see patented, I want to hear why they think it's so special. We keep hearing that. Tell us what is unique. And I think that's yes. it. Just this is what we do. And here's one way that we're unique that people seem to really like. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. I want to thank our guest, Mark Eggleston, who was awesome, who brought a lot of sort of insight that I don't think either Mike or I originally saw uh, <laughs> on some of these topics. So thank you so much, Mark. And I also want to give a big shout out and thanks to our sponsor for this episode, Praetorian. Check them out. There's links to them on our uh, show notes in either the podcast feed that you're looking at right now or on our website, CISOseries.com. Mark, before I let you chat, Mike, anything you'd like to say? Mark, sir, thank you so much for joining us. As David said, really appreciate the perspective. Thanks for looking at things different way than the way that, that we had seen and, and bringing those up. I really like the advice that you were giving to Eric and folks like that who are trying to come into the industry. We need more of that. We need more people to get out there and say, here's a path in. We need the help. So delivering that insight and and helping out folks who are trying to get in. I really appreciate you bringing that. And that insight was incredible. And I hope anyone listening really understands how valuable those tips were. So thank you so much for joining us and for bringing those up. And Mark, I will let you close. And by the way, we always ask, are you hiring? <laughs> Well, thank you both. I really, really appreciate the opportunity. Great getting to know you both a little bit more. Am I hiring? We do have an opening or two openings, but they're both in the final stages here. Ah. Uh, so timing <laughs> is everything, right? As far as a plug, Dave, we should have had you on earlier. <laughs> as far as a plug, I'm going to go ahead and give thanks to the wonderful, wonderful team that I have back at Health Partners Plans because without them, I wouldn't be able to engage in these type of things. So, Jim, thank you so much for being the identity and access management and privilege access management leader. Nobody does it anywhere near as good as you. Dan and team, the way that you guys keep a watch on all of our assets, keeping the cyber criminals out and tweaking the secure email gateways at all hours really appreciate that. Daniela, you are a creative powerhouse. You are working hard every day to make sure our company's resiliency and make sure our business continuity program stays engaging. Carlton, you're the strongest privacy compliance expert out there I know. And the way that you work hard to ensure privacy practices keep being robust and efficient is just always appreciated. And of course, my family and in-laws that allowed me to kick them out of the house while I recorded this episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. That, I think, is a first. I don't think we've had anyone call out specific members of the team and thank them. That's great. That's awesome, that is awesome. Mark. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, audience, for all the content contributions that we get. Again, I can't stress this enough. This show survives and lives on your contribution. So the more suggestions for segments, awesome news stories, hot discussions, and what's worst scenarios, please send them my way. I greatly appreciate it. 
That's it. And if you haven't left a review, please leave a review. Ideally, Apple Podcast seems to be the most popular place to do that. But wherever you can leave a review or share with the community, we appreciate. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. This show thrives on your input. Head over to CISOseries.com and you'll see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.